Good afternoon. I call this meeting of the Human Services Policy Committee to order. Members, please take your seats. I will note that a quorum is present. And I'd like to welcome everybody here. This is our first meeting of the session. Uh, I like to try to make sure that we get started promptly at 1 o'clock. There's going to be many days where we are going to have a lot more we want to talk than we've got time for. And that's usually been the history of human services. We always get more bills than we could get to. We want to create as much opportunity to get as many heard as possible and to work together to get so many things that we have that are important to us going. So what I'd like to do is start off with introductions today. Uh, uh, my name is Peter Fisher. I'm chair of the Human Services Policy Division. I represent District 44A, which is parts of Maplewood, North St. Paul, and all of Little Canada. What I'll do is I'll go around and call on the uh, uh, everyone to introduce themselves. So I will go next to uh, lead uh, representative uh, Keel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, I'm Representative Keel. I live in District 1B, which is all of Red Lake County, Polk County, Norman County, and three townships in Clay County. But I live south of Crookston, so and farm, and I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Awesome. Welcome. Thank you. Representative Backer. Um, I'm Jeff Backer. Um, if you look on the western part of Minnesota, you'll see that hump bump tip elbow nose. The town I live is on that hump bump tip elbow nose. I'm the only member that my board, my district borders North Dakota and South Dakota. And this is my fifth term, and there's two of me. I have an identical twin brother, so thank you. Awesome, thank you. Representative Back Baker. Oh. Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, it's great to be on this committee. Um, uh, I represent most of uh, Candyway County, which is straight west of the metro. Uh, we are uh, home to uh, a great medical facilities, um, uh, Jenny O, turkey processing, one of the largest turkey producers in the, in the nation, actually, in Candyway County. This is also my fifth term. Um, again, I'm, I'm really pleased to be on this committee with you again, Chair Fisher. I think that what you showed us last session in our behavioral health division uh, was truly some really great bipartisan work, and I appreciated you able to touch the, br touch the brakes once in a while and try to do some good things. I'm looking forward to doing those things and writing good bills that we can all get behind. So thank you, and it's an honor to serve with you as well. Thanks. Thank you, sir, and looking forward to working with you also. It was, uh, it was a great partnership last two years. We're looking forward to continuing that work going forward. Um, Representative Curran. Hi there, uh, Representative Brian Curran. I'm from 36B, which includes Badness Heights, White Bear Lake, Gem Lake, Birchwood Village, and half of White Bear Township. Uh, happy to be here on the Human Services Policy Committee, and I've spent the last 20 years in nonprofit human services as well. So I'm glad to bring some experience to the table. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Engen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Elliot Engen. Uh, actually, Brian is my housemate or neighbor. So 36A, uh, White Bear Township, Lionel Lake, Centerville, Circle Pines, North Oaks, and uh, happy to be here. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Representative Finke. Hello, Representative Lee Finke. I'm from St. Paul. I represent District 66A, which includes portions of St. Paul, portions of Roseville, as well as Falcon Heights and Lauderdale. Thanks. You're welcome. Representative Frederick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm Representative Luke Frederick, the, Man the Mankato area, District 18B. Uh, I'm excited to serve on this committee. There's a lot of familiar faces uh, from the last couple of years, and it's already been kind of alluded to. There's a lot of work that was bipartisan that was done uh, in, a, I mean, it was the Behavioral Health Committee. I mean, this is a different committee this year, but uh, I think there's universal issues that face Minnesota that we were able to come together on, and I'm hopeful we can repeat a lot of that uh, over the course of the next two years. Awesome. Thank you. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Chair. I'm Representative Jess Hansen. I represent District 55A down in Savage in Northwest Burnsville. I'm excited for this committee again. My background's in social work, and so understanding the ways that our systems interact with each other to really have a downstream impact on children, families, and people who have been disadvantaged, whether they're experiencing poverty, homelessness, or more. And so I'm looking forward to continuing to keep those voices at the center of our conversation, and I appreciate you, Chair, for always doing that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, Representative Hink, Hicks. Hi, my name is Kim Hicks. Uh, I am the representative for Minnesota House 25A, which is down in Rochester. Um, and similar to Representative Hansen, I have a background in human services and disability policy and advocacy, and I'm excited to get to work from everything I've heard. Chair Fisher, we are in for a wonderful committee that gets lots of work done. Thank you. Representative Knorr. 
Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Mahmoud Nur. I represent District 60B, that is Minneapolis, all the neighborhoods surrounding the um, University of Minnesota in, the, in Minneapolis. Uh, this is my third term. I look forward to uh, working with uh, Mr. Chair uh, to make sure that the human services on the other side, as the chair for human service finance, we get things done. Thank you. And then Representative Novotny. Thank you, Chair Fisher. Uh, second term on the uh, or second time serving on this committee I represent Elk River 30B uh, it also has now then Oak Grove and parts of Otsego uh, my concern is uh, focused on long-term senior care and uh, mental care uh, care for uh, mental illness and incarcerated people thank you uh, next we'll move on to staff then as I uh, uh, ask the staff uh, please introduce yourselves whether you're partisan nonpartisan if you're a partisan which party you're with uh, start off with uh, Nick Stumo Langer uh, my name is Nick Stumo Langer I'm the DFL House Caucus Committee Administrator and uh, I joined the house as a staff person at the beginning of last session look forward to working with all of you uh, regardless of party I'm hoping I can be helpful and uh, answer questions and get things going here Thank you. Uh, Jared Margolis. Hi, everybody. I'm Jared Margolis. I am uh, the committee legis legislative assistant for this committee, and I am the legislative assistant for um, Representative Fisher and also for uh, Representative Brad Tabke as well. Um, and yeah, I look forward to working with everyone. Thank you. Uh, Spencer Kroos. Uh, uh, my name is Spencer Kroos, um, DFL Caucus Research. Uh, First time uh, in a research position, been a CLA for the last five years. So I'm uh, excited to be on the other side of the table. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan Cotter. Good afternoon, members. Jonathan Cotter, GOP Research. Uh, this will be my seventh session on staff. Uh, previously was with uh, the other body, so happy to be in the house. <laughs> happy to have you here. Uh, Danielle Pinelli. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Danielle Pinelli from the Nonpartisan House Research Department. And the issues that I cover are long-term care, economic assistance, and homelessness. Awesome. Thank you. Sarah Sunderman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Sarah Sunderman. I'm also from the Nonpartisan House Research Department. Um, I cover behavioral health and um, other human services issues for this committee. Okay, thank you very much. And then, uh, not at the table, but uh, sometimes that we'll see, and I think they might be out in the audience if they are, Doug Berg. There we go. Yes, I'm Doug Berg. I'm with House Fiscal Analysis. We're also nonpartisan. I don't staff this committee directly, but I follow it closely so that bills get routed in the correct, to the correct committee. Awesome, thank you. And then Joe Harney, if he's... He is. Joe is not here. Okay, thank you. And then also we have a, uh, we have two pages that will be staffing this committee, which they do very important work keeping us going, helping get the information out, collecting information for testifiers. If I could have both pages stand up, introduce themselves. We'll start over here on my right, and then go over on this side here. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you and welcome. <laughs> Welcome aboard. Well, thank you, everyone. I look forward to working with you all as we make progress for Minnesotans in our human services area for the next two years. Before we proceed, I'll note that a copy of the committee rules were distributed to the committee uh, beforehand, and they're posted on our website. If you have any questions or issues, please make sure to touch base with myself or Mr. Suma Langer afterwards and uh, be able to touch base on it. And at that, we have a presentation. Uh, most of this week is going to be dedicated to getting up to speed as to uh, what are areas that we cover, hearing from the department and hearing from uh, nonpartisan staff. And then hopefully next week, we'll probably be moving into bills. So I'd like to start off at this time uh, with the Department of Human Services today. Uh, we're gonna have uh, uh, time for questions as we go throughout. Uh, so as you have questions, please try to get a hold of my eye or, or one of the staff eyes so we can call on you. And at this point, I'd like to welcome Commissioner Harpstead. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And it's very good to actually see you all again. Uh, I'm Jody Harpstead, the Commissioner of the Department of Human Services. I've been Commissioner for the last three plus years. And uh, glad to be with you again this session. 
We have a presentation together here that we called DHS 101, uh, just to go over some of the basics of what's going on in the department and how we, how we operate. So. So first, the department's mission is that uh, the Department of Human Services, working with many others, helps people meet their basic needs so they can live in dignity and achieve their highest potential. We now also have an employee vision that when all employees are embraced, respected, and heard, we'll build a collaborative, equitable, inclusive, and anti-racist culture where we all thrive. Some basics about DHS. According to a recent consulting firm analysis that we were part of, Minnesota ranks high for involvement of the legislature. Some state legislatures pass broad statutes leaving state agencies to do rulemaking to shape their work. Almost everything that governs our work in Minnesota is in statute. <coughs> Minnesota is one of 10 states, I believe it's 10 states, that are state funded, county and tribal administered for the delivery of human services. So as we roll out programs approved by the legislature, we need to implement them through 87 counties and 11 tribal nations. In other words, it's complicated. <laughs> and guess what? Mistakes can happen. Give you an idea of our budget. We have a $23.2 billion budget here in, in, we had in 2022. Um, most of that is our Medicaid program. We administer the state's uh, $16.6 billion Medicaid program. 5.7 billion of that is state funding and 10.9 billion federal funding. Our direct care and treatment services, as large as they are, uh, represent $0.6 billion of our total budget. And the rest of it, our St. Paul policy funding and regulation teams uh, spend $6.0 billion. In terms of our organization, this year I've instituted an office of the commissioner where we discuss and debate uh, the, all the major issues uh, running the agency as we just did this morning. Our deputy commissioner for agency effectiveness is Shireen Gandhi, who's been with us now for many years. She's responsible for finance, compliance, what we call service transformation, more on that later, process improvement and equity. So with the retirement of longstanding deputy commissioner Chuck Johnson, Shireen took many of Chuck's former responsibilities. And now under Shireen, we have all of our control functions in one place under one person, and hence the name agency effectiveness. Nikki Farrago, who is with us today, is our deputy commissioner for agency relations and culture. Uh, she has our legislative, county, tribal, community, and federal relations functions, and communications, employee culture, and our office of equity and inclusion. Chief of Staff Stacy Twight also with us this afternoon who does everything. <laughs> and then our General Counsel Amy Akbai. Next slide. Our Direct Care and Treatment Services under the leadership of Marshall Smith, our health system CEO, a specialized behavioral health system for those that others cannot or will not serve in the state. BCT serves 12,000 patients annually, has 5,000 employees, is about the size of the central care health system, if you want to think about how big it is, in central Minnesota. BCT includes 12 inpatient psychiatric facilities, the Anoka Regional Treatment Center and the Forensic Mental Health Program in St. Peter are the largest, five inpatient substance use disorder treatment facilities, the nation's largest secure sex offender treatment program in Moose Lake and St. Peter, outpatient medical, psychiatric, special care, dental services, group homes, vocational, vocational programs, and crisis services for more than 400 people with disabilities. And over the last year, they achieved the first of the four steps it takes to earn the Malcolm Baldridge Quality Award, which is usually a corporate award. I understand we would be one of the first, if not the first state agency in the nation to win the Malcolm Baldridge Quality Award. Our Office of the Inspector General under Inspector General Kalani Moti conducts background studies to determine if a health and human services worker has committed an act that disqualifies them from providing care, monitors compliance with licensing laws, rules, and investigates maltreatment and licensing violations, audits and investigates provider and recipient fraud, waste, and abuse in public programs administered by DHS, and recently refocusing its program integrity services on preventing and predicting financial fraud, waste, and abuse, starting with proactive, data-driven, equitable approaches in the child care assistance program, and also transforming the child care licensing system and modernizing child care licensing regulations. Our other four DHS administrations, our health care administration led by Cynthia McDonald, assistant commissioner, and also the state's Medicaid director. 
Children and Families Administration run by Tiki Brown, Assistant Commissioner. Our Aging and Disability Services Administration has been led recently by Interim Assistant Commissioner Natasha Mers. And our Behavioral Health, Housing, and Deaf and Hard of Hearing Administration led by Eric Grundahl, Assistant Commissioner. Three years ago plus, um, all, right after Labor Day, I came into the department with a 90-day plan for the, what was going on at the time and said there's nothing more important for the Minnesota Department of Human Services than to be trustworthy for the people of Minnesota. Trustworthy to the people who depend on our services to live full life and community and trustworthy to the taxpayers in Minnesota whose resources were entrusted with to use them properly, wisely and effectively. For our second term here in January, Going forward, we intend to be as trustworthy to the people of Minnesota for doing our work in a more flexible and responsive fashion as we are to the taxpayers in Minnesota to have a solid approach to accounting for funds spent, especially through an ongoing workforce shortage. You've heard us talk in the past about Operation Swiss Watch, the first thing that we did after I became, became commissioner to turn um, our attention to process improvements in the department. I discovered to my delight when I came that we have a team of 10 uh, green and black belt six, six Sigma process improvement people inside the department. I didn't have to go find a consultant uh, to help us with this. And I'm happy to say that the first round of our projects under Operation Swiss Watch were completed in this last December, just last month. At that means the team that has done the planning and laying out the possibilities have turned all of these over now to the business areas who are incorporating them into their daily work. A couple of highlights, our new Medicaid decision making initiative establishes decision making authority, approval requirements and clear accountability for any new Medicaid policy adoption, changes to policy and operations and fiscal impacts. Um, it assigns formal decision-making authority to our state Medicaid director, also our assistant commissioner of, of health care, brings together leaders and subject matter <coughs> experts across the agency to discuss and advise on Medicaid policy and operations, establishes clear roles and shared definitions in the change and implementation processes and develops a formal documented decision process using an agile apps database. We created this Medicaid decision-making uh, process after several years of implementing COVID waivers together, doing a very similar process, having all the right people around the table, and when everyone gives us the thumbs up on the screen or in person, uh, then the state Medicaid director can say, then yes, that is a good decision. It's documented and kept, and uh, we know uh, how decisions have been made, and that all the right people were uh, consulted. We've also implemented our contract integration system in the Behavioral Health Division and are working to implement it across DHS. Very excited about the potential of this. It moves our grants and contracts work into the 21st century by converting the work from a paper to an electronic system for the first time in state history on a system called Agile Apps. I love that name. It's not a decades old mainframe system. It operates like those online ordering applications that keep telling you you can't place your order until you've done all the required fields. And that's what it does for all of our people who are doing RFPs, grants, and contracts. It saves all the documentation in a central system organized by grant category, date of the work, who completed the steps, et cetera, so everything's kept. And over time, we're eager to see that it allows us to pull data to show compliance levels, speed of the work, number of times certain steps are problematic, equity and grant making and anything else we might want to ask of the system as all of our grants and contracts finally in the same location. We've been working on subtraction. I think you've heard us talk about that. Uh, when I came to talk about our housing and homelessness audit in the uh, fall, I mentioned that it takes 85 steps for us to go from an RFP all the way to the end of a contract. And we're looking now for opportunities to reduce the number of steps and the length of time it takes to get money out the door to the people who need it in Minnesota. We will be reducing that number from 85 um, for an RFP and 61 for a single source contract to 73 and 54 as we implement the contract integration system and some other duplicative steps. Full implementation of the contract integration system will cut another 10 to 12 steps in the process, resulting in a 30% reduction in the number of steps to get grants out the door without compromising accountability and oversight. And as we dived into this and really took it seriously, we discovered we had the ability to remove a lot of these steps because we added a lot of these steps. They didn't come through statute. 
for the op or the Office of Grants Management in the Department of Administration. And so we've been able to simplify our own grant making process and we'll take it out for a spin this year with new grants and see how it goes. And just to show you why we needed to do that, here's an example of the grants and contracts in our behavioral health division. The red line, of course, is the increase in those grants over the last uh, uh, 10, 11 years. And the bottom line is the number of staff doing those contracts. And so uh, sorry that we did not anticipate the pandemic, but we didn't. And so, uh, so much of the COVID money, federal and state, suddenly upon us and having to be processed. And then the state budget surpluses, for which we are all very grateful, also uh, gave us a lot of opportunity to do a lot more grants. And so our grant volume has increased exponentially here in recent years, and uh, we're wrestling to keep up with that. So to have this automated system to manage those grants and contracts is, couldn't have come at a better time. We've also added through uh, Shreen Gandhi, our agency effectiveness deputy commissioner, an entire compliance oversight and reporting structure, uh, which Shireen was hired by the department to bring into place several years ago. And so she has a chief compliance officer and the director of internal audits reporting to her. Uh, she then uh, works with our senior strategy team and all of their um, administrations. On the bottom right, you see that we have a process control champion in each of our administrations who focuses their efforts on bringing each of those teams together to think about the better work that we can do in process control and then forms a work group to bring that to our senior strategy team. Our senior strategy team are 50 um, senior leaders across DHS. We meet quarterly uh, and every quarter we um, look at, we have our, our assistant commissioners come in talking about some of the risks they see in their work and the risk mitigation strategies that they've put in place. So every assistant commissioner is now accountable to come to that group, including the commissioner and staff, to tell us what they're doing to mitigate and reduce risk of problems in our system. We also want you to know that 2022 was mostly a year of solid audit findings in the Department of Human Services. If we don't come and tell you about these, you don't see them very often. So we wanted you to know about uh, many of the good audits that we had this last year. Our managed care organization, personal care assistant, and counter data and oversight rated generally complied with a few things we need to do to improve. Our homelessness and housing support grants you've already heard uh, us testify about in the fall perhaps. Um, and there's some areas there that we need to improve. Um, child protection removal and reunification, minimal findings in that audit. Our uh, 21 annual comprehensive financial report, no DHS findings at all. And then our federal single audit uh, was issued in May, went from 32 findings in 2020 to 13 this past year. We we're focused very heavily on those quarterly senior strategy team meetings when our assistant commissioners come in with cleaning up old audit findings as well as talking about what has happened uh, recently. And that single federal audit identified no misspent or misappropriated funds in the 15 months of COVID related funding audited to date. Finally, our, our most recent audit was our PERM audit done by the federal government, our Medicaid payment error rate. You can see under the top, on the top chart for the three categories of Medicaid that they uh, audit, Minnesota is ahead of both its cycle one cohort, which is a cohort of certain states, and ahead of the national average with zero uh, errors in our Medicaid managed care um, work. The CHIP uh, program, uh, we also have some very good results in a couple of categories. CHIP eligibility is an 18% error rate because Minnesota does CHIP eligibility very differently from other states. You know that Minnesota is often unique and uh, we've recently identified a policy change that we think can greatly impact that particular number, but we're still ahead of the national average, though behind our cohort in CHIP eligibility. We've been interested uh, this last year in studying second stories. There's always another story. In DHS, there's always another side to every story. And we're hoping to have those conversations with you over the course of the session. If, and a good example is that housing and homelessness grant audit that we uh, had in the fall where we, they found internal control deficiencies. 
several different second stories. One was it was a pandemic and we were getting people off the street and into shelter and we used an expedited process to do that. Another way to think about the second story here is our financial reconciliation is now complete after the testimony we did on this audit and no sign of fraud or misspending now that we're finished with it. And the other side of the story is we had five other great audits in 2022 which you often don't hear about. So we just like to balance the stories that you hear with the second story. Just a little bit about our history around our COVID activity. We passed 120 waivers of rules, regulations, and guidance to get counties, tribes, providers, Minnesotans through the COVID shutdown days. Each one required, as I mentioned earlier, approval from DHS legal, finance, compliance, minutes, our equity office, assistant commissioners, subject matter experts, MMB, and ultimately the governor's office. Most have now been stood back up. It turns out it's harder to put things back together than it is to waive them. <laughs> uh, but we've been through a lot of that. A uh, prime example of, of one that's uh, been codified as ongoing by the legislature is all the things we learned about telemedicine during COVID, which has been a real boon to a lot of uh, folks in Minnesota. The big project ahead of all of us this year is the county and tribe recertification of recipient eligibility for Medicaid and Minnesota care, which starts now for sure in April of 2023 and ends in March of 2024. Uh, we've done this process in the past um, annually through our counties and some of our tribes, uh, but the usual annual recertification volume is 1.2 million recipients. The post-COVID volume has grown to 1.5 million, so it's going to be a very large project for our counties and tribal nations to take on. And the data in the system is now three years old. The counties and tribes are used to having to do a quick update once a year for recipients of Medicaid, and now their data is three years old. They may have moved, they may have had more children, other things have changed, and now uh, the data is up to three years old. So it's going to be an enormous task, every state in the nation facing exactly the same process. We've brought Deloitte in recently under contract to help us put together a project management plan to do this well. They're working with other states that are standing this back up as well, but you'll hear a lot about this this year, our biggest single project. We're also working very hard on what we call service delivery transformation. We used to call this our IT plan, <laughs> and now we're calling it service delivery transformation because we're dedicated to investigating digital service options to reduce administrative burden on partners and customers. You have probably heard about our MN benefits application where families can go to a county office now and sign up for nine benefits in 12 minutes. And so we're eager to do much more of that with our service delivery transformation. It supports innovation and efficiency by providing stakeholders better access to our systems and our data improves our methods of measuring and tracking outcomes, collaboration across teams and agencies to deliver for the people we serve, and supporting equity initiatives by giving direct voice to impacted populations about their needs during the decision-making process, which include residents, providers, counties, tribal nations, and DHS staff. And just this morning, I got an email <laughs> suggesting that our service delivery transformation efforts are getting some national attention. We're about to be invited to a national conference to talk to other states about looking at our work this way instead of thinking of this as our IT plan. When we look at the capacity of the department, from 2018 to 2022, our overall budget grew by 30%. Remember the chart of the behavioral health grants. Our overall budget grew by 30%, while our office staff grew by 2%. And our Medicaid budget grew by 31%, while the staff working on that has actually declined by 2.74%. With this rapid influx of COVID state and federal dollars, as well as our state surpluses, our usual formulas that we've used over the years for how many FTEs we need to put in a bill did not keep up with what we needed in HR, finance, compliance, and legal. No surprise, really. Uh, in the past, we had general uh, annual adjustments that we would ask you for, and then we would put some FTEs in the bills to handle each of the incremental bills that we needed to deal with. But during uh, the rapid influx of all those funds we've had in recent years, that formula didn't work so well for us. And so we'll be back to talk to you about that. And of course, the workforce shortage doesn't help either. So expect requests for additional staffing to get funding out to providers mm -hmm. as soon as possible after this year's session. 
How we've made it work is improving efficiencies by investing in automation and technology, streamlining processes and workflows to reduce the time and resources to do the work, improving financial controls, integrity and oversight, subtraction, as I mentioned, eliminating unnecessary steps in the work itself. But all of these have not been enough. In fiscal 22, our overhead was 2.69%. Without more staff, it'll remain low or, or below 3%, and we think just over three is the right place for our overhead. In the last couple of years, our new assistant commissioner for agency culture has done lots and lots of interviews and focus groups throughout the agency and helped us to develop our new standards of culture. We are working to commit to excellence first and trustworthiness, then flexibility and responsiveness to the people of Minnesota, and then inside the agency, caring leadership, diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, and anti-racism, learning and development, and employee engagement. We've just finished a cultural assessment. It's just rolling out into the department now. We used an outside uh, co consultant to do qualitative research, listening to meetings uh, and doing interviews and focus groups on what it's like to work at DHS. It shows us the work we need to do to embed those new standards of culture into the organization for years to come. Some recent issues that I wanted to address and uh, uh, be willing to certainly answer questions and I have a few more slides uh, after this as well. Uh, we've heard so much about uh, high behavior or high acuity patients uh, who no longer need hospital level of care but have, are struggling to find a place to go, looking for the right setting for them in the community. Um, as we've talked with lots of folks about this and dealt, we've had some of our staff um, do some extra work to dive in and help find individual patients places to go so that we would understand the on the ground issues around this. and. Um, what I have learned as we all talk about it is the solution to this is no one person's job description. The problem that we're facing is because of the workforce shortage and, um, and where we're at with the number of people that we have to serve these high behavior patients. And so it's going to take the whole community to come together to solve it. Uh, last week we called a meeting of representatives from hospitals, nursing homes, um, group homes, uh, Hennepin County, for example, and our, our direct care and treatment teams. And we asked them all to come with their three best ideas for how to deal with this issue this year. We're looking for some short term, what do we do right now to make this better, as well as some things they had uh, in mind for the longer term. Uh, we've just taken those ideas and sent them back to them and asked them to rank them. Um, their top 10, we're going to meet again with that ranked list and talk again and expect to see some of the results of that conversation uh, during the session where we can put some things in place to make this pipeline move more smoothly. And we're really eager to hear whatever ideas you're hearing from constituents as we work to solve this problem together. Many of you have heard about our work with our CCBHC model of integrated behavioral and healthcare. Um, Minnesota was one of the pioneers of the CCBHC model nationwide. We were part of the original demonstration project at the federal level that, that began the CCBHC clinics and has been bringing it to this point. Uh, the federal government's been telling us several times that the demo was coming to an end and that we needed to now move to an ongoing sustainable level of funding in our Medicaid programs. We particularly took that, uh, that uh, expectations seriously this last year had a whole plan to go back into our Medicaid state uh, plan with these uh, clinics and then the federal government in September extended the demo again um, in talking to folks and thinking it through we made the decision to go ahead and end the demo and for to step out of the demo and move to a state Medicaid plan environment We've had tremendous pushback from the community uh, since we made that decision. And I've recently made the decision that we will revisit our decision. And we have a meeting coming up. We had one last week. We have another one coming up with providers who are transitioning from the demo to the Medicaid plan to really understand what they believe they're going to lose in the transition and to uh, think again about whether we should uh, look back at the demo as a way to proceed. Um, the CMS has uh, told us that they're expecting to have a path to re-enroll in the demo if we need to do that, and we'll make a decision as a community about the best path forward. Uh, fraud has been in the news a lot lately, and I know you all know that. Um, 
We have a very active Office of the Inspector General at the Department of Human Services uh, who is actively looking uh, for ways to uh, prevent and deal with fraud. We have a track record of doing investigations every year and uh, both disqualifying people and stopping payment to organizations who we have found evidence of fraud in. Given the recent connections between the Feeding Our Future headlines and DHS, we're moving as quickly as we can to investigate any possible fraud in DHS while bringing forward statutory language to give us more ability to act quickly when seeing fraud in other agencies across state government. The history of our statutory authority, it all revolves around finding fraud inside DHS. And so we'll be back uh, to talk to you more about that. But I would like to leave you with a list of what uh, we believe are our biggest possibilities for the next several years. We had a retreat with our senior management team this fall, and here's some of the things we imagined. What we asked them for was their biggest possibilities, and that's when you think about the whole range of things that could happen over the next three years, what's the biggest that's possible? And here's what we said. Developing a short, powerful set of metrics of disparity, uh, income, employment, housing, longevity, hospital admissions, for example, and build equity into the walls of DHS to see these metrics move. We got this idea from the CDC, who has set a set of very short set of metrics to measure and, and move the needle on disparities. Demoing new population-specific healthcare models like IHP and population-specific total cost of care. Many of our healthcare providers coming out of COVID are eager to get back to some of the innovations they were working to implement before COVID and to see what we can do to improve our overall healthcare system. Expanding mental health and addiction facility capacity and integrating behavioral health strategies with housing strategies. Eric Grumdahl, who now manages our behavioral health uh, administration, of course, came from the Interagency Council on Homelessness and is eager to put together his experience uh, with homelessness and behavioral health. And then along with our uh, colleagues in the Interagency Council on Homelessness, taking a stand for racial justice, gender justice, housing justice, and health justice. <clears throat> We are eager to initiate additional work to make Minnesota the best place for all children, including black, brown, and indigenous children to grow up, and to keep Minnesota in the top five states nationwide for older adults and people with disabilities to live in. Demonstrating new models for older adults and people with disabilities to live in integrated settings in a workforce shortage. Removing any unnecessary barriers to patient progress through the MSOP and other civilly committed DCT services and reducing our carbon footprint with fewer and solar powered buildings, electric fleets, and an educated workforce. Some of our biggest possibilities for our partners in the community, developing robust approaches to co-creating our work, knowing, like really knowing the data on who gets our grants and moving that measurement to those who most need our services to live full lives in community. Building out our systems and processes to create a seamless, state-funded, county, tribal-administered, full human services system. We've been working much more closely in recent years with our counties and our tribal partners. Subtracting unnecessary rules and regulations that don't impact health and safety or prevent fraud and abuse for a time of workforce shortage. Becoming a systems product orientation committed to the integration of human services. Making all of our work widely accessible to all Minnesotans and our biggest possibilities inside our agency to improve our capacity as a flexible, agile, responsive customer service organization, lock in trustworthiness with our compliance plan, our Medicaid decision-making process and contract integration system, achieving that Malcolm Baldridge Award for DCT, moving to the fifth or sixth pillar of our anti-racism multicultural continuum and accelerate process in the inclusion of the LGBTQIA 2S plus community, veterans, and people with disabilities, and work toward the realization of our employee vision statement, making DHS a great place to work, to develop careers, and promoting from within whenever possible. Thank you. I'm happy to take any questions. You might have. Thank you, Commissioner, for the presentation. <clears throat> Are there questions or comments? Uh, Representative uh, Frederick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, 
I want to say, th say thank you to the commissioner for coming and talking to us today, uh, and especially highlighting some of the work the department is doing in the substance use disorder world. Uh, that was definitely a space that Chair Fisher's committee uh, tackled in the last couple of years that was bipartisan, and I appreciate that, and I hope we can continue that work going forward, and if we can be legislative partners in that work, um, I look forward to those conversations as well. One of the questions that I have is uh, talking about staffing specifically. Uh, facilities like St. Peter that you talked about, the forensics program there uh, has a staffing issue. Uh, there's somewhere between 40 plus line staff vacancies that they're trying to fill, causing staff to work overtime shifts, sometimes uh, voluntary, sometimes mandated. And I, I would imagine that if someone's getting mandated overtime after overtime shift after overtime shift, the quality of that work goes down because people start to get burnt out which then leads people to quit and not want to work because they're putting their lives on the line in some of these situations. Uh, because it is a job where we are asking people to show up to work, to have all different types of bodily fluids thrown at them. Uh, there are cases of assaults where state employees are getting uh, hospitalized because of the assaults that they are happening on the job. So my question then is, when it comes to these staffing issues, uh, money is a factor. Uh, because we've seen wages go up at Target, at Walmart, at uh, all these different places, at Quick Trip, uh, that it is not competitive in the wage space. But also knowing that when you can make even if, if it is a little bit less money at a Quick Trip or Walmart or something like that, uh, but not have to face you know, getting assaulted on the job, I'm curious what DHS is looking to do to help increase workplace safety. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Harpstead. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you, Chair and Representative. Of course, we'll be asking that question in every sector of the economy during this session this year, because uh, the workforce shortage is affecting everyone. And so we're doing the same kinds of things that many other systems are doing in terms of looking at um, different approaches to um, overtime and um, thinking about um, overall incomes, um, we're going to wrestle in this session with, a, with the fact that a lot of our state surplus is one-time money, and we'll need to be uh, judicious about how we use the tails of the state budget. Um, but really uh, doing the same kinds of conversations with health systems across the state, understanding what everyone's doing, thinking about what might work. There's no magic answer to this workforce shortage. It's an it's a issue at least as difficult mentally to think through as what we did, had to do to think our way through COVID. And so I, I think we're gonna have some really in-depth conversations this session about all of that and what it is that we might be able to do together to get there. Um, you know, and we could, we could do additional supplemental wage bonuses, et cetera, uh, but those are gonna have to be funded and we're gonna have to have those really hard conversations about how much to do. Thank you, Commissioner. Representative Bradder. Uh, one other question. When it comes to some of these workplace uh, shortages, work staffing shortages, uh, I think every industry out there is facing some of the same issues, and so it's no surprise to anybody. Uh, the U of M had some research that they put out saying that they ex <coughs> expected in the, uh, in the healthcare fields <coughs> that there's going to be a shortage for a long time. So my question is, you had mentioned talking about trying to get people into the most integrated setting, into, these com into the communities across the state. Mm -hmm. Putting one person in a home or putting a small number of people in a home, uh, while it might be in the best case there, it is also the, the maximizes the staffing need. Uh, so my question is, are there options available to do some sort of congregate living to decrease the overall staffing need to get people into the community? And I'm not advocating for spaces like Anoka or St. Peter or any of the offline uh, big regional hubs to be, I don't know what the word, activated again, however you want to phrase it. Uh, but are there other options that DHS is exploring to be able to serve more Minnesotans? Uh, because if we just continue to focus on you know, one to three or four people in a group home maximizing that staffing need, that my fear is mm -hmm. that there's gonna be many Minnesotans that don't get any services at all mm -hmm. by doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm looking for what kind of outside of the box thinking DHS is, is doing to try to address the needs of as many Minnesotans as possible. Yes, I thought a lot Harp, about go that. Ahead. I'm sorry, Chair. No, I know <laughs> it's gonna take a little while to get used to going back back to from the rhythm here. Zoom so to sorry. in person again. Thank you, uh, Chair Fisher and Representative. Um, I thought a lot about that, and um, on the one hand, you're right that a, a in-home 
care is often one-on-one, -on -one, but a person providing in-home supports often also has three or four other clients, so I, we have to think about that as well. Um, we don't want to go back to a position in Minnesota where we've got people institutionalized that, that can live in an integrated setting in the community, so we have to think about all that. But in our conversation recently with the many facilities I mentioned, we, uh, we had people bring up the notions of critical access nursing facilities, maybe smaller but congregate. Um, another opportunity that people mentioned was the ICF model of disability services, which is larger than a four-person group home, smaller than a nursing home, for example. And do we need to go back to some of those mid-size uh, facilities? Uh, one thing I'm coming to the conclusion about in our workforce shortage is that we need a whole variety of lots of different models instead of a one-size-fits-all. So in the past, way past Minnesota, we had everyone institutionalized. Then we went to everybody in four-person group homes for disabilities, for example, and now we're moving much more toward home care. And I think the way to answer the workforce shortage is going to have a rich rainbow of different options for people across the whole spectrum and see which uh, shakes out over time as, as the preferred model. Thank you, Commissioner. Representative Frederick, any further questions? <laughs> okay, next I'll have Representative Baker, then after that I've got Representative Hicks, and then on to that uh, will be Representative Nor. Representative Baker, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, one of the things that I have heard over the last, uh, I suppose, year or so, visiting with our local public health agencies, the county, the county folks, is uh, they really have noticed um, a lack of sort of timely responses from DHS when it comes to questions for different things under the county public health. I, I don't have anything specific, but I think what, why, what, what many of them have uh, teed me off with uh, their, their gut feeling is when so many people relocated to their homes and that Arthur Anderson building is basically pretty empty right now, is there a plan to start reintegrating staff back into the agency building because I think they felt that the responses were much better, more more quickly gotten back to these folks with a lot of questions to keep to keep the uh, uh, you know the healthcare systems on the ground in our counties to be acting much more quickly. What is the plan? Knowing workforce is our number one challenge right now, um, is there a plan? What is the plan to sort of bring? that unit back together like we have done here in the Minnesota House and the Senate and others. What is the plan for DHS to bring employees back to work? Mm -hmm. Commissioner Harp said. Chair Fisher <laughs> and Representative Baker. Um, so far we've been very flexible with our employees about remote work because we effectively managed the agency for, th for almost three years um, remotely. Um, and when it comes to at least our um, policy administrations. And um, also, uh, to be competitive for workforce, to have enough people to do the work, um, we, need, we believe we need to be flexible about remote work. I have not seen a correlation between our remote work and work getting done. Um, I'm looking at people at working very, very hard all day long on screen instead of very, very hard all day long in the office. We've even found some amazing efficiencies, just the not driving in and driving out. You got all that much more time to take three more meetings and that sort of thing. So I, I so far have not seen a correlation between um, getting work done and working remotely. Um, if, there's, if there's something taking more time to get back to people, it could be that we're hard pressed for our own workforce and that we don't have enough folks to uh, to get back as quickly as we might have in the past. But I, I, I don't see a tie to remote work. I'll, I'll take that under advisement and, and watch for that. Uh, but I'm not sure that's the, the issue here. Thank you, Commissioner. Representative. Uh, just a quick follow-up. I will try to get you more specifics to that. I, I don't disagree that through the process of, of remote working that there's been some real benefits to everybody to that. Um, I know other agencies were not getting some of the uh, and again, I, I want to choose my words carefully. I don't want to say poor customer service scoring just with DHS as the others as, as it relates to maybe MDH or others because we're all in this, 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 this uh, customer service game together, all of us sitting here. We have to respond to our citizens properly and efficiently and timely. So I know that having them at home certainly does help with a number of things, but also working from home myself. There's a lot of distractions at home too. And that can also create some real problems of being focused and, and having other folks and other things around. So 
Um, I know that we'll work through this. Um, I'll try to get more specifics, but I, I, uh, I brought that up because I think it's, it is valid. I want to make sure that we hear from our, our county partners out there and uh, continue to try to find a way to utilize our facilities here too because there is something magical about getting to work together again, even if it's more uh, uh, two or three days a week versus five days a week, that still has a real gain to it. So I hope that we're at least hoping to move in that direction. So I appreciate you being here today. Thank you. Commissioner Harps, add anything? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Baker. Uh, next, I'll go to Representative Hicks. After that, I've got Representative Nor and Representative Pinky. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Hartstead, for being here today. You spoke about 87 counties and 11 tribes and that our unique model can lead sometimes to mistakes. I heard you talk in your possibilities section about collaboration and, and the beginnings of some of those solutions. Does the department have any concrete suggestions to the legislature to improve those collaborations and reduce those mistakes? Commissioner Harpstead. Yes, uh, Chair Fisher and uh, Representative. Um, well, yes, I mean, our whole compliance plan across the entire agency is our main thing. And um, things like the contract integration system, and as we get that up and running, there'll be more where that com came from as our agency effectiveness team continues to look for more and more ways to, uh, to work. Uh, we've had many more meetings in recent years with our tribal nations and our county partners. Um, we formed our county tribal DHS leadership uh, forum where we talk about these issues on a regular basis and try to solve problems together and um, in during COVID there were times for example when as I mentioned there were difficulties getting people who were finished with hospital level of care out to another setting and rather than saying sorry that's the county's job call someone else we just had someone dive in and try to fix it and and solve problems and so we've done more and more of that to the point where we've added some people in some of our state uh, department um, areas to, to literally help troubleshoot I issues in the community and not just say, sorry, that's a different part of the system and send people off. So um, just a lot of additional work like that and, and uh, working closely with uh, uh, the Association of Minnesota Counties and MAXA and our tribal nations. Uh, we're excited about how many of the tribal nations have, de have become human services initiative tribes and they're more interested in taking on services for their own members and even offering them to the communities around them. And, um, and, and so just continuing to slog away there at uh, working together more closely as much as we possibly can. Thank you, Commissioner. Representative Hicks. Thank you so much for that, Commissioner Harpstead. Um, so I know collaboration is prioritized when it's in job descriptions. And it's prioritized when we, when we embrace it and put it as a priority. Do you feel, and you mentioned in COVID, there's been a lot more of that. Do you feel like the department had what it needed to, to do that? In terms of statutory authority and that sort of thing? or No, in terms, in terms of, of I, I guess this is more of a finance question, but just in terms of FTE to kind of do all of that intensive collaboration. Commissioner Harpstead. Yeah, Chair Fisher and Representative. Um, yes, I think so. And, um, and again, it's a constant, uh, need to improve this notion of our standards of culture with uh, coming out of our assistant commissioner for agency culture is a very deliberate investment and effort to have us focus on the culture of the department and to say we're going to move in a new direction here with our partners and let's bend every sinew to finding a way to do that and so we've got a lot more people focused in that area and I think it'll pay off here over the next several years. Thank you Commissioner. Representative Hicks any Thank further? Thank you so much. Thank you. Next, I have Representative Knorr. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, Commissioner, um, <clears throat> I think there's been a lot of discussion about the long-term care, uh, the issues from nursing homes to group homes and many other challenges. Um, just to give us a preview, and by the way, thank you for centering on equity and inclusion based on what the agency is doing right now. Um, if you can give us a preview, I know we've had several issues uh, that there's so many nursing homes and group homes closing and even the payment rates. Uh, if you can give us a preview, where are we headed with the long-term care? Commissioner Harpstead. Yes, Chair Fisher and Representative. Um, uh, we have some data that we can show you when we get to that subject here in the committee um, showing that over the last 20 years, Minnesotans have increasingly um, 
so, sort of voted with their choices to opt for home care instead of uh, congregate care uh, for people with disabilities and older adults. So we can show you that. We've had very few closures, actually, of uh, group homes for people with disabilities unless a provider was consolidating homes, for example, uh, over the last year. And um, not very many nursing homes, more, but not all that many. Um, not that it has not been a struggle financially, uh, given what's going on for those uh, facilities. Um, and so I think, again, we need a whole variety of different models for people to choose from uh, going forward. And yet the long-term care uh, space does need an additional investment so that people remain in that work uh, and don't opt for something else because we certainly need uh, places and spaces for folks whose family can no longer care for them in their own homes. So um, the recently announced uh, negotiation with the SEIU Healthcare for uh, PCAs and, and home care services, I think is a reflection of, of an, uh, an investment in that space. And, um, and I think we'll, we'll see more of that as we go forward. And then we just really need to talk about these different models. Um, some providers have seen it as an opportunity for themselves to train their staff to handle high behaviors and to, and to offer to serve people like that. Um, others are concerned about keeping people in their facilities with high behaviors. Um, but some are seeing it as, a, as an opportunity for their future to become specialists in that space. I've been, I've been uh, interested in watching the, the uh, group homes for people with disabilities take on higher behavior people as an opportunity to grow their agencies instead of shying away from it. And they've done a marvelous job with folks in one, two, four uh, person settings um, to help people live in community. So um, we all need to do a lot of redesign here uh, coming out of COVID and into the workforce shortage to figure out what our business models look like in the future. And we'll all need to have a good, healthy conversation about all of that. Thank you, Commissioner. Representative Norris. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay. Uh, next, I have Representative Finke. Thank you, Chair Fisher, um, and thank you, Commissioner, for your presentation. Um, my name is Lee Finke, and for the record and our future conversations together, my pronouns are she, her. Um, I am happy to see that among your goals is to make Minnesota the best place for children. Um, I would love to see trans and gender diverse children among your list of places that, or demographic children that we can make this the best place for. Um, and I just wanted to, one of the things that I would like to connect with you about and um, learn about on this committee and in our work together is what your um, policies are for inclusive placement for trans, queer, and gender diverse folks in your facilities. Um, I also know that in other agencies, there are policies that are clearly not being followed, and I would like to sort of make sure we're enforcing those rules when we create inclusive rules for all of our um all of our residents in Minnesota. So I was just wondering if you could give me just very quickly like where you are on um, what those rules look like and how you feel like enforcement is going. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Harpstead. Chair Fisher and Representative, mm -hmm. I apologize. Our biggest possibilities mentioned the LBGTQIA 2S plus community regarding DHS employees, but not the people we support in Minnesota and the best place for children. And so we, we need to include that. Um, and we need to do a lot more work in DHS, understanding the community and its needs and how to make sure they're well served. Um, we've done a, a lot more work in recent years on anti-racism work than we have in this space. And we need to really um, spend more time understanding and making sure that people have equal access. Um, and so that's a, a piece that we'll need to do. We've been supportive of uh, things like eliminating um, conversion therapy in our Medicaid services and, and things like that. Uh, but really down at the, um, at the provider and, and facility level, really understanding what else we need to do, uh, we have more work to do. We often have a problem with data uh, because we collect racial data and we're not collecting gender data, as you know. And so uh, understanding where we're at and what we need to do to, to work on it next is, is sometimes tricky. Um, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't be making sure that we really understand how we're doing and work to improve it. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Representative Finke. Uh, I just 
Thank you, Chair. Uh, I just want to thank you for that work you have done on racial equity and make sure we understand that uh, working towards racial justice is working towards queer liberation. So I appreciate all of that. We can't separate those. We just need to make sure we're serving all of our residents. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Binky. Uh, I do have a couple of questions and comments, just checking as there's any other hands before I start. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, for being here. I very much appreciate it. I, I do want to say that over the years, I've been fortunate to work in the homeless youth world for over 15 years. And I will say that your division of OEO that works with the homeless youth has been doing, has done a great job. And one of the things where I saw that quite a bit is the way that they would work with the real small nonprofits who struggle because they aren't real large, typically don't have a chance to sometimes get the grants to be able to get into communities that are very underserved. And I want to say that in your in that division, I've seen that work happen quite a bit where they've reached out. And I know that occasionally they've gotten dinged because they've been bending over backwards to make sure that the uh, nonprofits are able to get the resources to do the work and not go under because so many of those uh, uh, nonprofits are under resourced to start with and it makes all the difference in the world when timely payments happen etc and I can tell you that over the years I've seen the payments speed up quite a bit from where they used to be to where they are now and how your division that division has done a great job of reaching out to make sure they're staying up on it uh, and where I also saw was in the homeless youth world is where they were working uh, particularly those who are dealing with the cure transgendered BLT GLBT group uh, is where they were trying to find uh, organizations that would make sure that they're being respectful in that space. So I know while it's not everywhere in your agency, there are some parts of your agency that are doing that work very well. And I hope that gets spread out to the rest of your agency there. Uh, the question that I have is kind of more in a policy, and this is a bit more a bigger policy thing here in the state is we've had a policy in our state that we don't take inflation into account when we're building our budgets. And one of the things that I'm wondering is from your division, having that policy that we don't take inflation into account, how does that impact the work that ends up happening out there? Does that make you more efficient, less efficient? How do you, how does your agency struggle and, and balance that? Chair Fisher, thank you. Um, I had the delight also for 15 years before I came to state government of working with homeless youth. And, um, and our OEO group is very much a center of excellence in yeah. doing technical assistance with nonprofits uh, to help them apply for state grants. And um, it's something that we talked about a lot in recent years, um, that to be sure that our dollars are going to where they're most needed in the community would require us to shift some of our energy and effort toward more, towards smaller neighborhood-based, small town-based yeah. um, nonprofits who can be really helpful at the local level. Um, so our first step would be to reduce some of those 85 steps it takes to get a grant <laughs> uh, so that people can actually get the work done and, and get the grant. Um, and, um, and anything we can do to make our grant making simpler is, is a key thing. I, I think when I first came, the conversation was a little bit more around teaching smaller nonprofits how to do all 85 steps. I think it's going to be much faster if we eliminate some of the steps and make it easier to get grants. Uh, and then to continue to reach out and, and do technical assistance. We've been doing a lot more of experimenting, I should say, in co-creating our work with community by reaching out and doing listening sessions and talking to people with lived experience to understand what's really needed on the ground across the state. And then uh, I think we should also uh, take some of the same venues to discuss what it takes to get through the system and get a grant and, and, and get some work done and understand what we could do to make things simpler for people that way as well. Um, you're asking a, a, a significant macroeconomic question <laughs> about inflation in the state budget, and, and I'm not exactly an expert on, on what that was like before or what it would be like if, if we did it again, but I, um, I, I totally appreciate with all of the um, excitement and possibility of this year's state surplus um, that, um, Funding, funding staffing at the Department of Human Services is not the top of everyone's list as they come into session, and we always understand that. Um, and I think we're probably being much more proactive this year to say that we've reached a level where we're concerned about the level of staffing that we have and our ability to meet everyone's needs. We have had more complaints in the last year about how long it's taken us to get grants out to the people who 
um, who need them after you approve them at the end of session. And I know you're getting those calls as well. And so um, I think it's time for us to really look at that issue itself and see what we can do together to do a better job. We've been as efficient as we could. We're known for being a large agency that always comes through and figures it out somehow, but I think we've done that just a few too many times to the point where we're really understaffed and need to um, have more resources to meet everyone's needs faster. Sorry, I'm not quite directly answering your question, but I'm not sure of the impact of inflation in the budget. If we are able uh, to make the case for operating adjustments and enough FTEs in each of our bills to, to rebuild some of the staffing that we need to be responsive. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. So I'm, uh, as I'm understanding it is that inflation has had an impact and what it's been doing is it's causing posi more positions go unfilled than it would otherwise as you try to take mm -hmm. care of the increases that happened elsewhere in the agency uh, that are, are not always driven by staffing but might be lease costs, uh, utilities, all those other kind of things that people forget about. And as a result, that sometimes impact on the number of people that you can have on board. That, would that be correct? Uh, yes, that absolutely, that math happens for sure. Um, and so sometimes unfilled positions is our one source of dipping to find some money to cover other expenses that have arisen over the years. That's absolutely true. Thank you, Commissioner. Reminds me very much of the nonprofit world. Yeah, that's that too. <laughs> Well, thank you. Are there any other questions for Commissioner Harpstad today? I am not seeing any things. So Commissioner Harpstad, uh, Assistant Commissioner Burvick, thank you so much for being here today to take our questions. I will mention that the presentation that we had had given to us today is online, is available for people to, to catch online there. Uh, I want to let people know and remind them that uh, we're doing education going forward for the coming week here in both Human Services Finance and Policy, and that you're all invited to the joint meeting tomorrow on finance uh, in the Human Services Finance side that will be held from 1 to 2.30 here in this room. So even if you're not on that committee, please feel free to, if you're available, please come. Uh, this is going to be kind of a continued thing because while we're not finance, so much of the policy we have ends up rolling into the finance side and vice versa. Sometimes when they're looking at finance, it comes back into the policy side. So I'll make sure that people feel very comfortable being able to hit on questions back and forth. Uh, Representative Norris, is there anything that you'd like to add seeing that as your committee? Mr. Chair, thank you. I think you covered it very well. So looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. All right, thank you. Thank you everybody so much for being here today. And with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>